Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast about your Kindle, books, and all things Amazon. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is October 26th, 2018. Welcome to you from Ocean Park, Maine, where I have returned to reconnect with Darlene after her two back-to-back quilting workshops in Portland. She has been working on two fabulous new quilts based on images of my grandsons, Jake and Ryan, that were taken here at the beach this summer, which seems like a long time ago when we see how chilly it looks out there in the water and on the beach today. I recorded the interview for this episode last week with Simon Eskilzen, a software expert who works at Shopify and who wrote a stunningly original post, I thought, on his blog about exactly how he reads books. As you will hear, his approach has implications for future improvements to the Kindle platform that I hope might be considered by anyone at Amazon who might be listening. If someone was to come around with some hardware that was even like 50% worse than the Kindle, but open up for easy highlight consumption, making it easier to um, like see what highlights that my friends have done um, and all these sorts of things, I would switch in a heartbeat. In news, I'm going to point you to a couple of articles that I read this past week that I thought were quite interesting, so there'll be links to them in the show notes. The first was at Apple Insider, and the headline was Amazon Kindle versus iPhone XS Max, that's 10S Max, choosing the best ebook reader. It's a thoughtful and very detailed analysis of the reading experience on a uh, this large iPhone, that's the one that I've got, the iPhone XS Max, and uh, an ebook uh, reader like the Oasis. Uh, some of it I, I made sense to me. Uh, one thing which I left a note on because I didn't agree with it was that the writer said that the killer feature for the Kindle is how you can read books on it anywhere, anytime, even in the brightest of sunlight. Well, of course, that is one of the advantages of the e-ink Kindle. You can read it here at the beach, and you can read it at a coffee shop outside uh, and that's that's a distinction but I, I thought that that missed the more important killer app for the Ian Kindle which we discussed with Kevin Keith at the Paperwhite uh, preview in New York and that's the undistractability of the platform that when you're reading a book on an oasis or a new Paperwhite you're you don't have the the temptation to glance off and check a tweet or a notification or text or anything like that. You're just reading the book. And, and I think that's the, the part of the Kindle platform, which really is genius. And it's also the reason I am perfectly happy to have both devices, this large iPhone with the screen, because when I am reading at the doctor's office or somewhere that I have brought my iPhone, because I always have my iPhone in my back pocket, uh, but I don't have my Kindle. It's it's much nicer to read it on the larger screen. This is the I don't know if it's the largest screen that you can get on on a smartphone these days. It's certainly the largest iPhone that has come out to this point, and it, it really is pleasant to have all of that real estate. It does seem it's a little too long versus the width for me, and for that reason, I do prefer the Oasis. Its dimensions seem more pleasingly like a, a page of a book. But if I have the iPhone with me and I can read, that's great. When I am reading at uh, night, when I'm falling asleep and I want to just be thinking about one thing at a time, uh, the Oasis is better and obviously uh, being outside is better too. But I I think you'll enjoy reading this and there are a lot of uh, comments afterward that this article generated. I love them because it was clear that people reading the story were passionate about their favorite way of reading. One aspect of it that caught my attention was if you're reading on an iPhone, of course, then you can read the Apple books. And that's, you've got two things you can do. If you're on an Oasis, you can't do that. Same thing with a fire. Uh, Okay, that's interesting. And there was a comment about how beautiful the Apple books are, but how there are more books available at the Amazon.com site for Kindle books. There was a comment posted by uh, Elian Gonzal, 
and it said, here's another killer feature of the Kindle. It's from a company that takes reading and books very seriously. Apple has a dilettante approach to its book reader. The latest iteration does nothing to make reading more enjoyable. Same old stupid typeface is not even an option for their serif San Francisco. No ability to change line height for those books where the text is invariably too scrunched on a page. And most egregious, you cannot have a sample you've downloaded on one device available on the other. Oh, sure. You can now add it to want to read, but even that pales in comparison to the Kindle, where any sample you're interested in is right there for you to download. Apple Books is pretty, but shallow. <laughs> uh, I would echo that. I would go even further to say when you look at Amazon's leadership in bringing uh, books from uh, other countries into English, uh, when you see the the power of the Kindle Direct publishing platform and how many books that has made available. The whole ethos of Amazon started with books. And I think we always hear when we talk to Amazon executives at these product previews that it's still very much in the DNA of the company. Not so much Apple. Uh, we all recall things that Steve Jobs said uh, that were kind of disparaging to books and the fact that the first iPad, oh yeah, let's let's have a an Apple Books uh, feature on there. Uh, kind of an afterthought. And even though successive uh, Apple executives in charge of the Apple Bookstore said, oh, now is when we're really going to get serious about books, it doesn't seem to have happened yet. The other article that I want to recommend to you is by Stephen Levy, who I think is just one of the best tech writers around. Uh, he, he wrote a, a great biography of Steve Jobs, and he's covered Apple for years. Uh, he's also uh, had great access to uh, Jeff Bezos. And in a recent uh, edition of Wired Magazine, he has uh, an article about Bezos, and it's about... Blue Origin. Now, what happens to a lot of writers who have a chance to uh, interview Bezos is they, they want to talk about Amazon. They want to talk about the cloud or Alexa, all the different things that Amazon is doing that are sort of at the front of the news. And then, especially when you see Bezos interviewed on stage, uh, you, they'll say, oh, yeah, and, and by the way, tell us about this space thing you're doing. Uh, that's kind of cute, you know, and and Bezos gets all fired up and he talks about colonizing space and, and all of that. And the, the interviewer just usually seems to be saying, oh, man, we're getting we're getting near the end of our time here. Let's uh, let him blabber on a little bit more about space and then we'll be done. Well, Stephen Levy wisely goes right into the heart of the topic of why Jeff Bezos is investing a billion dollars a year of his own money to fund Blue Origin. And it, it the result is, uh, I, I think you just get more of a sense of why Bezos describes this as the most important work that he's doing. And uh, obviously there's talk about how he was so excited about space as a boy, but the actual strategic thinking that he puts into this uh, is highlighted by the Levy piece. A couple of interesting anecdotes. I'm always looking for anecdotes when I see somebody write about Jeff Bezos. Uh, one is that he, inter he reviewed a book by George Dyson. I think it was on the Orion Project. And it was only one of three reviews that Jeff Bezos has ever left on books. I, I don't know where what the other two books are i wouldn't be surprised if one of them was remains of the day but uh and then the other thing which is mentioned is the relationship between jeff bezos and elon musk who of course has his own spacex company and there's a quote where bezos uh, he has dinner with musk in the fall of 2003 and afterwards or maybe talking to levy he says he's a good guy we're kindred spirits but that it didn't really pan out and there hasn't really been much. I don't think they, I don't know if they've been to dinner together since that one back in 2003. We had probably seen this other places, but it was confirmed that Blue Origins capsule is going to be carrying humans into space in the first half of 2019. Uh, I think Levy was kind of speculating it might cost $200,000 to get a seat. Eh, pretty tempting. I, I have this, having finished my M MIT course on Bitcoin, I've, I'm putting a uh, you know, a, a losable but not insignificant amount of money into Bitcoin is, uh, in the next few days. And if it were ever to explode and go back up to 19000 compared to the $6,400 per coin now, uh, and, and I had money that had sort of fallen from the sky because of this 
cryptocurrency speculation. Uh, I can't think of a better way to spend it than getting a seat on the Blue Horizon capsule. It might be a nice place to interview Jeff Bezos for a future podcast sometime floating around in, in the three minutes of weightlessness. He's also quoted as saying, I'm not going to work on anything that I don't think is improving civilization. That in, And he says in the long run, blue, as they call it, uh, is the most important. Great article, well written, uh, highly recommended. Simon Eskelzen grew up in Denmark and moved to Canada about five years ago. He came to my attention via a blog post he wrote titled How I Read. Simon works at a company with a big behind the scenes presence on the internet, but its name is not yet a household word. In fact, my first question got the name of his employer wrong. I called it Spotify. The, thinking of the music streaming service, which really is a household name, instead of Shopify. I reached Simon last week in Europe by Skype from Cambridge, Mass. He begins by explaining what Shopify is. It's a it's a commerce platform. So if you are if you want to sell something, then Shopify is a good place to be. We help you sell in person and also online. It's mostly for people who want to have their their own brand and not be part of a a big marketplace like you know your podcast is a lot about amazon and it sort of hides the brand away so for example if tesla wants to sell their merchandise they still want to control the entire experience Uh, so they might they do that on shopify so there's a lot of very large consumer brands especially in north america um, that sell on shopify um, europe as well Um, but yeah it's, it's so, and on those sites, you would never even see the word Shopify. It, it's all completely in the background. Exactly, exactly. It's all in the background. So that's why you, you know, you said Spotify in the beginning. Um, that's, that's I did. Did I say not? We are. <laughs> that happens before. You're not the first one. <laughs> Shopify. I was once introduced on stage, and someone said, "Yeah." Someone said, "Hey," and this is Simon from Spotify. Oh. Um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. So but it it sort of points out a good difference, right? We're we're not a consumer brand. Our mission is to make our merchants successful right um we are not the um we we want to you know make them make them look good and that means not throwing our brand every you know right and left in front of all of their all of their buyers interesting well now uh a post that you wrote in july uh that caught my eye. I think Dan Doyen had recommended it or put me in touch with you on the basis of it. 5,300 word post. That must have taken a while to write. It was titled How I Read. And what did you hope to accomplish by putting that much work into writing about how you read? Yeah, so I, when I started reading more heavily about five, five years ago or so, the Kindle was already out, right? So I didn't, I didn't sort of go. I'm a lot. I'm, I'm younger than you, so I didn't go through the paper book phase very much, other than, of course, through school. But something that about a year or two in, I was really frustrated with was that while technology had helped the reading experience, it sort of had just. It seemed like a very lateral shift. There wasn't in terms of comprehension, retention, or engaging with other people around the book. None of that changed, right? The book club hasn't changed. The memory hasn't changed. And we've learned so much about memory in the past couple of decades, space repetition, and all of these things. But none of that has really made it into the technical realm. And I think that both Goodreads, as Amazon, has done a fairly poor job at trying to elevate that experience despite the amount of data and people like consumers of their platforms they have it's very hard to use that data even for personal consumption let alone building apps on top of all these highlights recommendations and so forth so that frustration sort of is something that i've been um i've had for for several years and i build a lot of idiosyncratic processes around that which the post is a witness to and the post really, the motivation for me was that a lot of people ask me about this sort of because I, I talk about tidbits here and there, and I just wanted to share it all in one and start a discussion. And since then, I've, I have a lot of interesting email threads with people who, who found the post, and it's been a really good experience. But really, I want to continue to push that discussion of just making reading a lot better when it comes to retention. When you made that change from not reading much to reading several hours a week, 30 to 50 books a year, what what led to that? What made you uh, turn to reading at that point? Yeah, I think it was a bit in two phases. So at, at Shopify, there is a 
there's a bookshelf on the main floor and on that bookshelf our ceo puts some of his favorite books and i remember at some point back then i wasn't really reading much other than articles and things about a software which is which is what i spent most of my time doing and i pick up this book called the design of everyday things and i just thought it was a wonderful book and it still influences me to this day about how i built how i built software and how i really see the things around me it was just an amazing book and then I started reading more books about building. I read uh, Christopher Alexander's uh, Timeless Way of Building, which was also extremely influential. And I just saw that, wow, going more sort of T-shaped in terms of, you know, I have my foray or my area of expertise, which is software, but going really wide and trying to get some of the big ideas and the big disciplines and applying those, that really seemed to have bigger benefits than just reading more papers and more things about software. And then the second phase was I, um, I was asked to lead a team about two, two and a half years ago, and I had no management experience. And that was a daunting task. You know, now there is people who had a lot more experience than me. And my first report was someone who had mentored me when I started at the company. And I really didn't want to screw that up. So I started, you know, waking up early and spending the first couple of hours a day reading. And I sort of as, as this was ramping up, I got more and more frustrated with, well, I'm not, I'm not retaining all of this. It's not coming into action. And I started thinking more about it, talking more about it. I started writing as part of my process. Um, but those were sort of the shifts. So the leadership and then the, this more serendipitous experience of picking up a good book. In your post, you, you split the reading process into four parts, which seemed really helpful because they're so different. Uh, maybe just give us a, an overview of uh, the pieces that you analyzed. To me, the, the four phases are the first phase is what I call sourcing. And this is borrowed vocabulary from the world of recruiting, where when you need to find someone for a role, you go out and, and source candidates on LinkedIn, blog posts, conferences. And for me, the book sourcing is you know you might recommend me a good book today a friend might recommend something or i might read a post and when that happens i most of the time i just cure the um the amazon link into instapaper and then i have a script that puts it into um a spreadsheet um Technically, it's something called Airtable, which is um, someone described it to me as a spreadsheet for millenniums, which I think is incredibly accurate. <laughs> um, but essentially, that process is about all these recommendations, put them in one place and have that be a good ally for you when you want to read your next book. Because as a lot of the time, whatever you end up reading is somewhat random. It's whatever is on your Kindle or whatever was just mentioned at the right time when you were finishing up a book. And I refuse to believe that that's the optimum strategy. Like I, I, I want to think that I can do something that's maybe at least, even if it's just three percent better over a lifetime. That's a huge gain um, overall. So the sourcing is important, and it's essentially just getting all of that in, collecting the endorsements of the book and various other heuristics um, for it. The second phase is choosing, right? So. Which one of these source books is most relevant to what I want to learn right now? So if I'm in a position where, okay, I really need to grow the team, I need to think more about team composition, I might read a book like Principles from Ray Dalio. Um, if I then need to do the actual recruiting, I might read the top grading book by, I can't remember who wrote it. So essentially, that process is about, okay, what's most important and applicable right now? Because if there's one thing that I've learned about retention, and I think the science will confirm that, is that if you can put whatever content is in the book into practice tomorrow, it's going to stick so much better. So that's really, I really try to choose something that's really relevant to what I can apply right now. So, and the sourcing list really helps me. And then there's, of course, the reading part, right? Um, which is the third phase, which is actually sitting down and, and reading the book. Um, and there's various things that I found helps with that. Um, you know, at every chapter, you sort of pause a little bit and think about what did I read um, throughout the day or before I fall asleep. I'll for, fall asleep. I'll, I'll often think about what I've read throughout the day. Um, and this summarization and trying to build some models and some pictures is, is really helpful. I've experimented with a bunch of other techniques. Um, I've, I've experimented with uh, lots of highlighting, which I use a lot um, through an app as well that you've mentioned several times before. It's called Readwise. Um, actually, this week I'm building some stuff on top of that. Um, but really just trying to absorb as much as possible when I'm reading. And then there's the fourth phase, which I think is the most important one, which is the processing. So 
what you've read and trying to especially write about it, talk about it, or put it into action. Yeah, I see you do read some fiction. When you're reading a novel, uh, is it as kind of results-oriented, uh, or do you sometimes just lie on the beach and read a good story and, and not have your mind working so hard as you're, as you're reading or, or hope to retain stuff? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes, because I, my reading systems can, can get quite intense, um, I get into sort of lulls where, okay, now I just want to read something for the pleasure of it. And I think that's totally fine. And I, I, do read, I do read fiction, biographies, history, and I really like that. A lot of that is consumed in audiobook format. I love taking long walks and, and listening. When traveling, that's one of my favorite things to do, put in an audiobook and just go for a multi-hour walk to um, often a culinary destination. And so, yes, I, I do like fiction. And I think fiction is also even in a in the sense of trying to you know get something out of it that I can apply. You get you the, be these big pictures uh, and personalities are built up in books that you can relate and you can often try to process it with some of the things that you've read in other books. So I feel that they give me imagery and they often help me support other concepts. Um, for example, I was reading um, I was reading I think the last fiction I read was Anna Karenina by Tolstoy and I was reading a bit about Russian history at the time um, and it helped me sort of put that into context and I think that's a great uh, supporting function of fiction as well. So I am still so somewhat strategic around the, the fiction that I do read. One example that I recall from Jeff Bezos's personal history that he tells is the the novel. I think it's the the remains of the day. He credits that novel as giving him what he calls the regret minimization framework. That he he wants to look back when he's eighty and not have regrets, and that's why he left Wall Street to to form Amazon. So huge impact on his life from a novel. So I, I would think uh, the, the way you're putting any kind of reading out there as a way to inform your life and help your life uh, make uh, important leaps could apply either to nonfiction or novels. Absolutely, absolutely. There's some great mental models and ideas to take out of novels as well. Um, and I mean, that's why a lot of the classics have survived. Yeah. Well, when you are... are Paying so much attention to your reading process and inspiring other people to do, to do the same, do you have kind of a, a metric in your mind of uh, how do you measure the effectiveness of your, your current reading process and where it might be improved? What's, what's sort of the bottom line that tells you uh, it, it's where you want it to be? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and something that, that, I, that I'm starting, that I'm thinking a lot about. Um, it's, it's a pretty hard thing to do because what I would ideally do, do is that every day I could measure, you know, the, 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 the ad ideal would be I could go through my day and to know exactly which books influence that day and the actions of that day, right? That's the ideal, but then I got to work backwards from there. And I, I think I read, a, I read a post like many years ago with something that, that's, that, that still sticks with me. I think it was written by Paul Graham. And one thing that he said in that post was that, you know, just because you don't remember the book from the title and what it's about, it can summarize it um, just by the mention of the title doesn't mean that it doesn't stick with you. And if you reread books, you will find this process um, kind of helpful. And, and it's sort of certainly been eye opening for me that even these books that you felt that you didn't remember anything from, a lot of things will seem very familiar. And the analogy he gives is, is sort of a tech analogy of it's kind of like a, a, a program, a software program that works that you've lost the source code to. And I think that's a really good analogy. And so that also means that I need to, there can't be full fidelity in tracking everything back. So where I am now is that um, actually this week um, I'm working on consuming my highlights from uh, my Kindle highlights and then resurfacing them with some with a with a smarter algorithm that that sort of um, by some 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 personal heuristics and then I want to rate these highlights as to what is how useful might this be how well did I retain it from the last time that I saw it I have an index card system where I do the same thing and I think by the end of the year I'll start having the data to start looking at well 
you know, does it do things stick better when I write them down? So all the index cards are marked with like a W if I did some writing about it. They're marked with an A if I did something that day to really put that into um, into action. I've experimented with re- doing voice memos around these different ideas from books and then replaying them back to me um, on a personal podcast only for my consumption. So I've done a lot of different try types of things to try to retain and at this and by the end of the year i i think i should start having the data to to analyze that's fascinating uh books are long and they take a long time to read which makes me recall how careful you are in sourcing and then choosing books it's like it, it, it that makes obvious sense because if i'm going to sit down and spend uh you know 10 or 20 hours with something i better choose it carefully but the other thing i've worried as i've followed the space uh, as long as I have is that there's this nagging fear that books are anachronistic because it takes so long to read a book. Meanwhile, everything is flying by at the speed of tweets. And uh, it, it, it makes me wonder if just the way society is organized now among people that are really plugged into it, this will be seen at some point as a, a luxury from, uh, you know, the Victorian era when people could spend this much time on one source of information. But but you wrote, interestingly, counter to that. Why is it a good thing that books are so long? There's there's a couple of things that I want to touch on there. So I think in terms of the uh, dropping the book early, one of the things that I changed recently was that I stopped talking about a book while I'm reading it. Um, even if I've just begun it, and I stop putting on Goodreads that I'm currently reading any books. These two things make it a lot easier to drop a book early because it lowers the sunk cost of switching to another book. So I think that's a huge one. Um, There are certain small strategies as well that I found helpful. Um, For example, I remember a couple of years ago, I read a book about – um, about Brazil. And a lot of the time I spent just reading the first the first couple of pages of the chapter and the last couple of pages of the chapter because that particular author just sort of summarized everything. Now, if you do that, it does put more onus on your what I would call the processing type of the system because – the nice thing about a book that's 300 pages and talks about one idea, I sort of hate that cliche of, oh, like this book could have been two pages, right? If you think that that book could have been two pages, you have a ridiculously awesome reading system because I do not believe that you can retain it. So I think books have survived in this format because like a 300 page book for most people probably takes a couple of weeks to get to the end of. And space repetition is this idea that if you revisit, if I tell you a word today that you don't know, and then three days from now, a week from now, two weeks from now, and so on, on this exponential schedule, you're more likely to, to remember it. And that that is what a long book sort of does. Like it's on this exponential schedule. And I think that's a huge benefit. So if you can just sit down and read the cheat sheet of a book and remember it, you have a marvelous memory and I want to talk to you. So <laughs> the other thing that, that, that you mentioned that I think is interesting, right, is so – our book book sort of threatened as a medium like now we have a lot shorter news sources and uh social media and 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 so on so on so on i think that we're starting to see like a lot of pushback on that without getting too much into it and i think that people are going to start looking for higher quality mediums and that's what books are there's a lot of filters to publishing a book and those are really helpful um i think the the online ad industry has as a second order effect really just changed everything about how content content is published online it is really about how many clicks can i get rather than something else right and so i'm i'm hoping to it, it, whereas before you know if you subscribe to a news, newspaper it's like okay you know you tr- the, the economist might appeal to your identity as like oh i'm a you know spare time intellectual and a smart person therefore i should read the economist and now that whole barrier is sort of gone right now it's just whatever you can click on but i i am hopeful that there will be an oscillation back towards more of the like more filters in front of the content that you see um and i think I do um, like we um, we talked about before before we started recording the the Wright brothers book and in that book there was this really good analogy sort of to this of 
when in the in the beginning of the 20th century they were bike mechanics right the bikes were introduced they were like oh no this is the worst worst thing that's ever happened what are all these young kids going to do when they're going to be biking around not reading books they can get so far right and it's just like that's ridiculous in modern context right yeah exactly the books have survived a lot of uh, assaults on on spending time with them you mentioned something let's uh, talk a little bit about podcasting take a couple of ways in uh, you said that you listen to uh, site. You go to a site called ListenNotes.com where you can find interviews with an author after you have read his or her book. What? Why do you do that? Why is that a valuable part of your process? Yeah, so I, it's something I've started experimenting a bit more with recently. So I wouldn't do it immediately after a book. I would do it a couple of weeks later. And what is helpful is that over time you sort of you sort of build a an idea of of different um of different podcast interviews and what kind of questions they ask um but sometimes they may not have asked uh, they may not have have um talked to your author but when i'm when i'm done with a book i have so many questions for the author right like why why this why didn't you have a chapter on this what about this what about this what about this and some of them i can I tend to be able to be able to resolve, right? It's like, oh, I think the author might sort of have addressed it here, or there may be these reasons. But a podcast interviewer sort of had a, has the luxury of time and reputation to actually go and talk to the author about those questions. Um, so I find that really valuable, and I think it's much more valuable to go into the interview if you already have a list of questions and then sort of sitting there hoping that they're all going to be answered. So that's really why I started doing that. Um, and if you Google for some of the questions with the author on Listen Notes, which is sort of a Google for podcast then that's been really helpful as well it's sort of a newer thing like i i i'm i think i put that disclaimer in there as well i don't like to blog about things that are more aspirational so i will see if it sticks in the next couple of years but so far it's it's been a really interesting uh, part of my process well i'm always trying to improve my author interviews i do a fair amount of them in in that uh, you're sort of a consumer of them in a, at a high level what coaching would you give somebody who's sitting down with an author for uh, an audience like mine, which is pretty bookish, but maybe most of the people haven't read the author's book. Uh, what what should be the goals of that kind of a conversation that would be helpful? I think reaching out to your listeners about what types of questions that they have. Some will do a poll, right, of of different questions where you can where your listeners can can do that. I've seen more more uh, podcast interviewers do that, um, like Shane, who's behind the Farnham Street blog. I don't know if you if you're aware of that one, um, but he often tweets like oh i'm going to interview this person what should you ask and um it's a fun process when you tweet something that then is asked right but it's also actually out of genuine interest so i think that's a big one yeah good idea now you are a podcaster yourself and it's the first time i've seen some uh, run across someone who's using a podcast within a company as a way for the company to exchange information and advance the culture uh tell, talk a little bit about that initiative and, and what you've learned <clears throat> yeah so so Shopify has grown tremendously over over the, the years that I've been here. Um, I can't even tell you how many percent, but now we're at four thousand. And when I joined, it was in the it was the low hundreds as as a as a private company, and I felt that I was missing out on a lot of that growth outside of my department. There were titles that I didn't even understand. It's like, what can this person possibly sit down and do for eight hours a day? And I thought it would be somewhat creepy to show up. I'm, you know, as you as you've probably already <laughs> observed, I'm a, I'm a fairly sort of um, um, I come into everything with a list and an agenda type of person, and uh, it's sort of creepy to sit down with lunch with like uh, 20 extremely directed questions at someone. But it's not so creepy if there's a microphone instead of lunch in between you. Um, so that was essentially where the idea came up, and. Um, because I, I, I can do still a little bit of, uh, of coding, I um, whipped up an internal platform for, that works with existing apps where you can consume a, a feed that is private to you. So if you leave the company, you don't have you know, a steady influx of private information. And that's really the, the most challenging part of, of starting an internal podcast. Um, so it's been a great way for me to learn how to what's going on at the company and see the new roles that are popping up. And then also um, just a little hobby software project on the side. Um, but it, it's really challenging to get to security right. The easy way to do it is to build a proprietary app that consumes it. But I think that's 
really problematic. You want to hook into the existing conditioning, like everyone can share MP3s on Slacks or Slack or create another app, but that's not going to have the same kind of adoption. We see huge adoption internally. It went from just my one podcast three years ago to now the CEO has his own podcast publishing an episode every couple of weeks. Great way to hear his voice and part of onboarding. And there's now about 20, maybe 20 five internal podcasts because it's a couple of clicks to create one people use it for training for onboarding and all kinds of other purposes so it's really taken off culturally how easy is it for an employee to to listen to an episode do they just get on their iphone and tap on an app they don't tap on the podcast app probably yeah they do they, oh, they do. do so you go into our internal wiki and then you see oh here are the internal podcast you click on one of the links and then it it, it goes into the apple podcast or android app oh. whatever and you subscribe there so it'd be right next to the kindle chronicles then you would have like you know uh, my podcast toby's podcast and i think that's why it t- it's taken off right it, it's on your own phone it's not this this like you know corporate like special two-factor like craziness um getting security right for this is really tricky but worth it i worked at a, a company years ago and uh, those 20 to 25 podcasters within the company. I, I would think that if you're an ambitious person within Shopify, you'd think, well, I guess I'm going to have to have a podcast to, to join the cool kids. Yeah, and I think I think it's so often when we talk about cultures, it, corporate cultures, it's always about the sort of the big companies don't get a lot of credit for culture. It's always like it, it always feels like big companies are trying to preserve a small company culture. And I think that's such a like such a like non sort of anti-fragile sense of looking at it where, well, okay, like let's look at this as what can you gain when you have a large company? Well, you're going to have hyper specific um, interests where you have overlap, right? There are Slack channels internally for just this one particular type of dog that five people are really into, right? Um, And then also podcasts. That doesn't work in a 15-person company. So I think that's a really important question to ask yourself as you grow in culture. Well, what becomes possible rather than what can't we do anymore? Yeah. If uh, someone listening to us were to start thinking uh, in an organized way about their reading system, uh, and you make the point that uh, you described how you read yourself you weren't saying recommending your system to anybody else but how would someone uh, make some progress from whatever their reading system is now to something that might be more effective i think the number one biggest change anyone can make is to get rid of as many things that contribute to sunk cost to dropping a book that you're not interested in i think that that's such a like everyone has a book that they read in the day because it was so amazing and if you have a really good reading and sourcing and so on system then every book should feel like that right because it's just that right moment when you're most interested in something and i think that's the biggest one the second thing is to somehow come back to it right whether it's rereading or going to your highlights or um you know, noting down, doing a summary and looking at it. I think that's the hardest thing to do. And you need to figure out how you can do that in a way that's sustainable for yourself. I've experimented with so many things over over the long run. And sometimes I do a lot of writing. Sometimes I don't do a lot of it. But I think figuring out some kind of feedback loop to get back to the book, that's the number two thing. You mentioned earlier that uh, you think Goodreads and Amazon have done a, a bit of a poor job on, on this dimension. If you could sit down with the folks that are designing the next iterations of the Kindle platform, maybe focus on that first, are there uh, two or three things that you would say definitely this needs to improve soon in order for the the platform to really reach its full potential? Yeah, I think, I mean, if you could set me up with those people, I'd love to talk to them. And if they're listening, Um, So I think they've sort of tried, but one of the the biggest things that I would want is that I would want it to be easier for me to experiment, right? There is no sort of like app ecosystem around reading, right? Um, There's no integration with flashcards. There's no integration with anything else, right? Um, And Kindle have sort of tried to do this flashcard thing, but on the desktop, it's slow. It doesn't really work that well. I think Readwise is just miles on miles better and it's really difficult for other people to try to build on top of 
of um, of the Kindle. And now I understand how it's a strategic advantage, but you also get a lot of benefits if you allow other people to do that exploration. So that makes me a frustrated Kindle consumer. And if someone was to come around with some hardware that was even like 50% worse than the Kindle, but open up for easy highlight consumption, making it easier to um, like see what highlights that my friends have done um, and all these sorts of things, I would switch in a heartbeat. It would be kind of like uh, Alexa skills. I mean, Amazon's had so much success. Uh, they've got 30 or 40,000 skills on. I thought I turned them all off, but I hadn't. Uh, but you could have some kind of a, a Kindle skills ecosystem if they made it very easy for people to iterate and experiment. Uh, uh, that's a fascinating idea. Exactly. That's that's exactly what I want, right? Like Kindle apps, they have sort of a vocabulary app, but I it, I don't really think it's sort of it, it doesn't really work well for my needs. Like I have a completely lateral workflow and it's just a nightmare to get the data out. Like you have to connect your Kindle and ex- import it or um, like do some kind of scraping. And it's like this feels like this is my data. Like why? Why can't I do? I can understand why there may be licensing if you want to build on top and, and sell it commercially. But why can't I like become a better reader on your platform? That just seems silly to me. Hmm. Let's finish with a book. Uh, what's the most important book that you've read in the in the past year? Yeah, I think uh, Doing Good Better um, by Dave McCaskill, I believe is his last name. He's um, a philosopher at Oxford University, and he... I don't know if he's an economist mist or just thinks like one, but he's hyper-rational in his... In his approach to uh, to philanthropy, so and so one of the analogies that he brings up in a book that I think is 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 very hard to um, um, to have a counter argument with is it comes from Peter Singer, an Australian uh, philosopher, and it's that um, if you walk walk past a um, a dam and you see a little girl drowning in the dam and you're wearing a suit that costs around say four thousand dollars. And you walk past and don't save the girl because it would ruin your suit. Then, like, we have a, you know, I, I think he says, we have a very scientific word for that type of person. It's called an asshole. <laughs> and so the argument there is is that, well, that's happening. That's happening all the time. It's like $4,000 uh, is sort of the statistical amount that it takes to save a, a life. And I think reading that sort of changed my mind. And then the next question, which he also answers in the book, is like, well, where should you give it? What are the most effective things? Charity has always, to me, been this very dark thing. And you all you hear all about the warlords and corruption, but you don't hear about the organizations that spend all their time evaluating effective charities. Totally did a, like change my mind on that whole thing. And I think was a very important um, book for me to read. Hmm. You seem to be writing a, a post at your blog roughly once a month. Uh, are you working on the next one uh, that will drop soon? Do you know? Can you say what it's about? As I mentioned earlier, I, I really want to write posts about something that I've always uh, that I've already found to work. I think a lot of blog posts and posts in general are aspirational. They are things like, "Oh, I had this neat thought on the weekend," and then you never see it again. And and some of my posts in the past have been that, but. I feel that I I I, I want to write about the things that work, and a lot of the all of my posts almost are about things that um, ideas that I've developed like within my team at at Shopify. Um, and I think one of the next ones that I I might work on is this 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 thing that I find myself talking about a lot now, which is um, building things that age well. So essentially, things where you build them once and then with minimal maintenance, they actually continue to thrive. Um, think about something like leather; like often it gets better over time. Um, or if you're doing a construction project in your house and you have a supporting wall versus a wall dividing your basement and all the electrical stuff, the electrician set it up on the the wall um, that's dividing the basement, then that's not really the place to put it, right? At zero extra cost, you could have put it on the supporting wall, and now you can turn it into a den or whatever you want and tear down that wall with zero extra cost. So that's something I'm very interested in in software and in general, like how can you build system that age really well and, and what are some of the commonalities between those? Um, and so I, I, I've been talking with a lot of people about that recently and, and to develop my opinion on that. So maybe that's something that, that I'll put out, um, but I've got a long list. Um, it's probably every two to three months that I, that I hmm. find the time write something <laughs> well i'm glad you wrote the one about reading it fa- it's fascinating and i'm sure my listeners are going to have enjoyed it's like taking something you think you know and then just 
peeling off layers of it. So it was it was really a gift to people who love books as much as everybody listening to this show does. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that compliment. It means a lot. I have been speaking with Simon Eskelzen, Senior Production Engineering Lead at Shopify. Thanks very much, Simon. Thank you, Lyme. In content, I want to tell you that my sister's book, Heavenly Body by Stephanie Edgerly, is available for purchase at the Kindle store for $5.49 plus tax. She's been working on it for 25 years. Here's her description. The Bible bears witness to the spiritual mind-body connection. Heavenly Body is a collection of Bible passages, art, poetry, meditations, affirmations, and prayers created for caring professionals, friends, and family of those struggling with illness. It is also intended for anyone seeking peace with his or her own body. I have spent 25 years creating and illustrating this little book. I pray it will bring you inspiration and blessings in your life. It's not so little. It's 441 pages and her 36 original drawings of parts of the body are simply stunning, especially if you read them on a tablet or on a smartphone. And I'll be talking to Stephanie at some point in the show. We had a wonderful time going through Kindle Direct Publishing to make it available to the world. Next week's guest will be Kathy Doyle, Vice President for Podcasting at Macmillan Publishers. She was on the Digital Book World panel that I moderated in Nashville, and they've got a great story to tell at Macmillan, and I'm looking forward to talking with her. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Ocean Park, Maine. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.